Welcome everyone to another episode of uh, Clean the Geek. Uh, today I have uh, with me Mr. Gary Lewis. Uh, Gary, welcome uh, to our uh, podcast. Uh, Gary is the founder and one of the directors in Resourcify. Cool. Hi, Patios. Great to be here with you. Good to have you, Gary. So, um, jumping straight away into the into the questions, can you? Quickly, please identify um, your company and tell us a bit about what you do. Yeah, sure. So I'm CEO at Resourcify. Resourcify is a waste management and recycling platform. And what we do is we connect global companies together with local recyclers to basically help them have faster, cheaper, easier, more sustainable uh, recycling that puts you know, your company on the pathway to, to circularity. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what we do. And, and why Resourcify? I mean, why, tell us why you decided to start that company. What was the sort of pivotal moment that you said, this is actually something which is missing or is not done correctly and I need to somehow disrupt it or do it better? Yeah, I have a deep conviction that we will have a zero waste society in the future and we need to have that society uh, but the more we looked into that topic in the beginning the more we realized we do not have that right now and to get there we need circularity so basically we need to reuse things recycle things everything um, and we have the foundation for that we have the infrastructure for that yet we still burn everything uh, when we could be recycling everything. So it was a very simple sort of realization really that that occurred. And uh, yeah, what we do is we, uh, on the one side, we have companies who have this amazing resources, right? 80% of all waste comes from companies or commercial setting. Uh, and on the other side, we have these great solutions. And what we're missing is digitization and someone who can connect the dots and that's what we do. That's what we set out to do is to enable this sort of circular society that uh, that we need. Yeah. And that was just a realization process through uh, my engineering background and through uh, I worked in over 60 countries traveling around the world uh, in the shipping industry and sort of realizing that this is the same problem everywhere. Um, we need the same solution everywhere. So if you can make it simple for our listeners and viewers and describe one of your sort of key clients and how would the process work with you? What is exactly that you do? Because you're discussing about this dialization about the platform. Mm -hmm. Usually when we when we think in about ways, we think about heavy infrastructure. So what is exactly the solution you're providing? And can you describe it through a, you know, perhaps giving us an example with a client of yours? Sure. So the goal is really, how do you get a company on a circular pathway that they have cheaper, faster, more sustainable recycling waste management? And we do that through two things. So first we digitize, we digitize all the existing waste management and recycling uh, so that you know for all of your locations, what you've got, where it goes, who gets it and what is happening with that material. And once you know that, you can start to optimize. And that's the second step where we then help companies to uncover potential within their waste streams uh, to start separating, recycling, contracting new partners to help them do that. And ideally, you know, you asked for an example. So uh, we work with a lot of retail chains, uh, the biggest retail chains in Germany, they're all on the platform. Um, so let's take an example of them. You know, one of these chains, they have uh, 3000 uh, stores and each of those stores are using the software to digitize and run the operational waste management. And on the other side, we have the huge recycling network. And uh, over the platform, we run pickups, the documentation, uh, the accounting, the reporting. Um, um, so you have this operational basis for then optimizing and, and improving uh, the, the recycling. And we have retail chains, we have airports, we have shipping yards, we have hospitals. Um, so it's really cross industry. You have this problem of how do you manage waste at scale? And we have a solution um, yeah, for that. 
Excellent. And I want to I want to be a bit controversial here with you, Gary. I think there are um, in the corporate world there are many that they see recycling or waste management as perhaps an unnecessary expense, which mm. is uh, put upon them from regulators or a compulsory necessity, perhaps. Do you see, with all the corporates you work and all your clients, do you see now a change in the corporate mentality in the recent years? And uh, do you think that there is an actual belief in the companies that uh, going down the recycling or uh, upcycling or waste management road is the right thing to do? It's a challenge, right? Let's not go over it. So waste management could be seen, you know, as a compulsory necessity. I think you use these words also yourself. Um, and that is true, right? And that has been true until now. Well, where are we now? Through solutions like Resourceify. So if you digitize and then optimize, what do you get? Uh, you basically get cheaper, uh, more sustainable, than you were before. And in some cases you can even make millions, you know, it depends how big you are and what materials you have, but we have companies that literally make six, 10 million euros a year uh, through selling resources. So when you have that combination, um, if we think about the top of a company, C-level, this is very attractive, right? More revenue, cheaper costs, more sustainable. This is like, what's not to like about that? There is very few solutions at all in the clean tech space, right? It's a clean tech podcast. So uh, there are very few companies that can offer all three of those things. And we offer all three of those things. So yes, while I agree that that has been the case, I think uh, the trigger now is, okay, you know, all of these things are important. And then you have this regulation coming on top, legally binding regulation, which is sort of, you know, the headwind or, or, or the, let's just say the, the wind from the back which helps companies to go in this direction. Um, so, so it's a mix, yeah. But if you're talking just purely, you know, uh, uh, from the concept, yes. Yeah, so we need to we need to connect all of these dots and help companies to understand the impact and 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 the great things that they can do by putting their company onto a circular pathway and making that as easy as possible. Now. Going perhaps or jumping into a different, into a different uh, slightly matter, we we have the unfortunate events with the with the war in in Ukraine. Um, uh, I mean, it's been uh, more than a year now. But do you think that that sort of energy crisis in these recent events uh, triggered by the by the war uh, made people look at um, at waste uh, more as a resource rather than anything else, and have you seen any sort of practical examples um, of companies that have been trying uh, perhaps to reuse or um, to to captivate the value of, of their waste? Great question. The war triggered a huge discussion around energy. I think you're well aware <laughs> from you know where, where you're sort of playing. Uh, about this and your listeners will be uh, as well. Now, when you look at how energy is used, a huge amount of energy is used to make things. So just think about the whole process, right? So from extraction, processing, materials, reusing them, remanufacturing and whatnot. So I think you can't have a discussion about energy without also having a discussion about circularity. And that conversation certainly accelerated. Have we seen action as a result of that? No. Why? Well, circular going circular is hard. You have to coordinate a ton of stakeholders. You have legal uh, things, you have, you know, operational things, you have locations everywhere, you have materials, you have different contractors. It's tough to do something in that space. So I think it's much easier from a concept to understand, okay, energy, and then how do we solve energy versus making that next step and saying, well, what do we use that energy for? And then how can we improve that? And that's the whole topic of circularity. And that that conversation and that the action there is, is not happening uh, enough. However, of course, the companies which are doing something, they gravitate towards Resourceify. So, I mean, we've seen 
uh, uh, you know, a big company is leading by example and, and, and doing things, but I wouldn't say that broadly applies to, to everybody. No. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we need to do more and we need to, we need to challenge perceptions, perceptions and perspectives there as well. And yeah, demonstrate, I mean, if you look at the numbers, at the use of energy, yeah, and how we can, yes. how we can optimize that. Yes. I mean, if you look at the numbers, right, net zero 2050, how do we get there? 55% through energy transition. So half the picture. The other half of the picture, 45%, comes through circularity. Uh, and it's about all of those things, reinventing supply chains, reusing, recycling things, everything. Um, yeah, and I, I think people are just not aware of that. And I think we need more legislation that helps come, uh, connect those topics you know, together. Um, and uh, that will come. That will come. It's already coming, right? So the Green New Deal, there's a ton of stuff in there around circularity. Uh, most of the, a huge quantity of the COVID funding from a European level was put into clean, uh, clean tech innovation, of which a massive chunk of that flowed towards circular reuse, recycling, um, remanufacturing type uh, activities. And we will certainly see more of that in the future because it makes a lot of business sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think recycling is going to be part of the solution. I don't know if it's going to be um, uh, enough. I had this discussion uh, in a previous sort of, uh, 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 you know, guest that uh, that we're going to publish the um, the interview very soon. Uh, he's on the critical materials uh, industry, and okay. we we're discussing about copper. And, mm -hmm. and apparently, in the next uh, ten to fifteen years, we will need to dig up as much copper. As we did the previous five thousand years, That's just incredible. To meet, uh, just to meet expectations, and if we capture or all all, um, all copper uh, through recycling, we will not be able to uh, to provide more than ten percent of the of the demand, uh, you know, on that specific sort of material. So it's incredible, but it's definitely uh, recycling will will have to be part of the solution on on mm -hmm. resourcing and, and making this sort of green revolution happen, if you would like. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, copper is a very singular material, right? So I can understand the needs for that. You have other material categories where those number those ratios that say uh, are not as extreme, but I definitely agree, right? And but the question is again, why do we need to make so much new stuff? Can we not just reuse what we've got in in one fashion or another, right? Do we really need to go down that pathway? And I think yes, you know, for some things, and no for other things. And we need clear regulation, clear guidance on uh, what 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 that needs to look like. Yeah, so businesses can make the right decisions. Now I think this is a very good pass um, to my next uh, my next question. Uh, touching maybe something which uh, a lot of uh, a lot of people are critical in in where I sit in my sector in renewable and renewable energy, and a lot of the naysayers are essentially um, accusing us that we're not able to fully recycling or the renewable renewable uh, energy sector is not is not yet capable of fully mm. recycling. Um, uh, it's it's waste now. This is uh, this is this is partly true, uh, depending on on what you see it. I mean, we've reached a situation where a solar panel can be recycled uh, at more than ninety seven percent, and I think the biggest sort of uh, issue was with with wind turbines and wind blades. So mm. the industry has resorted in uh, in upcycling wind wind blades especially, uh, but also the manufacturers now are putting in place processes. Now mm -hmm. the key critical thing for us is is scale. So simply to put it simply, we don't have enough scale yet. So we don't have enough things going bad that needs to be recycled mm -hmm. in order to create that sort of circular economy, which is something which is gradually coming as, you know, more things are, you know, getting old and replaced and so on and so forth. Do you have any specific experiences within the renewable energy industry or do you have any sort of um, any requests uh, to resolve these sort of issues from, from companies within the sector? What we see a lot in the renewable energy space is the topic reuse. So uh, solar panel recycling, yes, but solar panel reusage, although they might not be as efficient, right? Uh, so we see a lot of activity there, which is something we're not involved with. Um, in general, I see that topic really 
uh, with the manufacturers, right, of the panels and of the turbines. And the question being, how can we design those products so that they can get them back? Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think they should be offering uh, take back programs at scale uh, for these products because they made them. So they best know how to sort of reuse them or reuse those component parts. And I think that's how we can close the loop. And that's where we play. And when it comes to take back and running those programs and getting things back and, and, and counting for all of that, that's what we do. And we do see a ton of activity there. Uh, yes, nothing which I can talk about, um, unfortunately, now, but uh, I think in, in this area, manufacturer supported take back programs from the producers of products makes a lot of sense. And arguably for all product categories, that makes a lot of sense. Ex extending uh, manufacturer responsibility uh, beyond consumer packaging and into other areas. And you see that in France, huge topic in France, you know, you have take back uh, responsibilities for mattresses, for child's toys, for some very interesting categories, <laughs> which arguably don't move the needle. And I think, you know, solar panels are a lot in the clean tech area, you know, a ton of great materials. And I, th I think if we see action in this space, that moves the needle, right? So e-waste, massive topic. Uh, and or so, uh, turbine blades uh, will be very shortly a massive, <laughs> so literally a, a, a massive topic. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's essentially adopt uh, best practices from uh, from from other industries and see how you can uh, adjust them to fit to fit the yeah. needs. Um, uh, and it works, right? It it, uh, it, it does really works. It does work. That's a that's a that's a very sort of uh, nice concept. I haven't I haven't I have I have to admit I haven't thought about it like this way. Uh, but but looking at it also, we're talking about this sort of green energy transition, and and we're talking about energy generation and energy capture and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And and when we talk about energy transition, we have to talk about energy storage. You cannot have one mm -hmm. without the other. So here we come to the sort of topics of uh, you know of, of battery storage, chemical storage, yeah, you know electric vehicles, uh, reuse of batteries, recycling of batteries, you know recovering materials, and again a very sort of interesting statistic was that uh, you know if we if we recycle batteries and we need to somehow recover lithium only then uh, we will not see efficiencies or recovery rates of more than 25-30%. Uh, mm -hmm. If we go just for the lithium and if we go for all the materials, then this will drop down to 10-15% to and it's going to be massively expensive for the energy consumed. Mm -hmm. what, what is your sort of take um, on this, on, on specifically on batteries and, and recovery and recycling of batteries? We work together, for example, with Johnson & Johnson, uh, who have uh, lithium uh, batteries uh, in their products, and we're helping them to collect those, get them back, and uh, recycle those those components uh, across multiple EU countries. Now, recycling when it comes to batteries is, from a regulatory perspective, currently far too challenging. So these are considered hazardous materials, uh, the transport and whatnot, you know, it's uh, it, it's costly. It's too costly and it's too hard. And that's why we're not seeing mass adoption scale of such recycling schemes, right? But we are doing it and we are seeing it. Um, but you're correct. In the most cases, these batteries are shredded uh, and the equipment is not sufficient to truly extract, you know, the, the materials uh, out of that uh, shredded sort of um, const constellation. And uh, what we see as the most successful uh, recycling or end of life usage for batteries, again, is reuse where, where possible, right? So especially from the automotive branch, uh, I mean, these, we don't need to go into this. Everybody listens to experts in this. Um, so reuse and, and, and after reuse, recycling. And how do you recycle? And for that, you need really great infrastructure. And there's a ton of great companies out there uh, creating this infrastructure, but to be fair, it really doesn't exist right now. And I think that's the next uh, uh, frontier on this topic is we need this specialist dismantling and extraction, closed loop uh, manufacturing process when it comes to batteries. And uh, this requires significant investment and is something which I think needs then 
uh, significant support also from a regulatory side or a funding side. Um, so, you know, what we do is we connect the dots between what's out there and what's possible. Uh, and what's possible in this area when it comes to batteries, I think there's a, a lot of development still still to happen, yeah. So essentially, again, it comes down to scale uh, and it comes mm -hmm. down to closing the loop. So you need the, the gigafactories that will recycle what the gigafactories are producing in a sense. There will be uh, reverse gigafactories in the future, yeah. yes. This will be the next, uh, you know, that could be arguably one of the next really big things. Um, but for that, you need a shit ton of cash. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, who who essentially wants to step into into that. Yeah, but that's the future, I think. Yes, reverse gigafactories. Reverse gigafactories. Here you are. You have. Uh, we have just uh, come up with a uh, with a new idea for Mister. <laughs> If anybody um, in your podcast wants to discuss that, they should get in touch. I think, <laughs> in principle, very interesting idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you should claim IP on that. Uh, <laughs> right, excellent. So, listen, we we uh, I just wanted to touch on perhaps a, a slightly different matter because we're talking about recycling, we're talking about material recovering, and this has to do a lot with local communities, right? It has mm -hmm. you know somehow uh, you need the local community to be engaged and also you know, building infrastructure that, that has that sort of, you know, usage around local communities is also a big hot topic and it's uh, a controversial topic uh, to say the least. Um, so can you share uh, with us perhaps a best practice model from one of your clients on how they've, you know, engaged local communities and, and the positive results that Resourceify and your clientele could be, uh, were able to deliver? Yeah. Let's take a very large community. <laughs> that would be our customer, Frankfurt Airport. Why, why is it a community? Well, Frankfurt Airport uh, has millions of passengers passing through this facility. They have, I, I think, over 200 sort of stores which are hosted there, you know, everything from McDonald's, really close stores and whatnot. So it's really like a mall and it's a place where people spend hours and hours uh, uh, you know, pre-flight, post-flight, and, and multiple times per year, and arguably that place plays a huge role also in the Frankfurt community. So I'd love to give that example. Um, what do we see? We see in that community a ton of material. Uh, you know, thousands of containers, bins, etc., collecting uh, materials, and it's the same question there. How do we maximize this? How do we close the loop on the stuff being thrown away there? And we had a really cool, uh, you know, we had some really cool results uh, by fully rolling out the Resourceify platform at Frankfurt Airport. Uh, for example, um, coming out of the planes. So we're capturing data around the waste and recycling the streams coming out of planes. And for example, in the Lufthansa planes, uh, there was a ton of um, LDPE coming back in, or, or PE. I, I, I can't remember the exact places. Yeah, I'm sorry, but. Uh, we had a, a, a ton of uh, used uh, uh, plastic and we were asking ourselves, well, how can that be? What is that? And ultimately, you know, through the discovery of that, through the platform and then finding closed loop partners for that, uh, Frankfurt Airport was able to close the loop on water bottles. So it was basically thousands of, of uh, water bottles coming back every day. Um, thrown away in the mixed waste streams and through working together with the manufacturer of these water bottles we were able to set up a closed loop program uh, for for the plastic uh, coming out of those planes and uh, I think everybody's been in a plane everybody's held one of these plastic bottles in hand which has I mean from the feeling uh, you know 50 milliliters in there you go like that it's like a shot of ginger juice or something you know and then the thing is empty and then you're wondering well what happens with this now and for me that's a nice uh, community sort of uh, thing of like okay if you fly through Frankfurt Airport, that bottle will be reused. There's a closed loop program for it and it will be recycled. And I think people will remember that when they go home and will start questioning how they can set that up for them themselves as well. Yeah, that's a very good uh, that's a very good question. I, I have to I have to I have to admit that I've never thought of a, of an airport as a as a community, but uh, you're giving us a very sort of uh, different perspective here. Um, now coming back perhaps to to resourceify, just uh, you know coming back to you to what you do and and focusing a bit on on, on the on the company, uh, you are in a growth phase. 
uh, right now. Uh, you, you're also raising, uh, as far as I understand. But I wanted to discuss about the key challenges that you're facing um, as, as a startup, as a digital sort of uh, up and coming, uh, uh, you know, company. Is it money? Is it people? Uh, is it other resources? Because frankly, I mean, whoever I talk with, one of the biggest issues right now, no matter whether you're in the UK like me or in you know, Germany or in Italy or in Spain, whatever, resourcing and people is one of the fundamental issues uh, that, that, that we face uh, post-COVID especially. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so what are your biggest challenges? Well, we've been doubling the team every six months for a very long time now. And uh, certainly, uh, as a company, we have a unified mission, right? How do we create a zero waste society? And how do we do that through the product? And how do we help our customers to realize that and, and, and get those advantages? And that's a mindset. And so how do we make sure that someone coming into this company who might not have been in the space before, but needs to make important decisions within the product or engineering architecture or whatever uh, about, about this so that, you know, we still maintain that consistent story, although we're growing so fast. And so, yeah, definitely finding people, but it's not just about, we found someone, they start, everything's fine, right? It's about training people. Uh, and then really helping them to be the most successful uh, in their role so they can have the biggest impact that they are trying to have by working in a clean tech company like Resourceify. So people, absolutely. Uh, and if you have the best people, you have the best product, period. Um, so we put a lot of effort into, into people, yeah. Um, certainly, it also must be said, it's a very challenging macro environment right now. So back to our previous question of... Uh, you know, how, how do you stand out above the noise in this energy topic? Uh, and that's also something like generally speaking, right? We're not only trying to position ourselves as a company, but we're trying to position the topic of circularity on the table, right? It's not that we're coming in and trying to sell you an incremental improvement in process X, Y, Z. It's it's like, guys, let's, let's take the blindness off. Let's talk about circularity and let's make this happen. Uh, and here's the product for that, right? Um, so yeah, certainly feels like a lot of pioneering work. <laughs> um, uh, but that, that's what makes it exciting, right? But then again, if you have the best people and they're trained and they know and they believe in the mission, then uh, this is a very, uh, yeah, it's, it works. I think we're quite aligned here that uh, people are the sort of key ingredient of making things happen. Um, and uh, we, we do something similar. We try to put the topic into the center of discussion um, uh, by, you know, creating content like we do now, um, like creating white papers, you know, sharing statistics, providing, you know, doing research with our own sort mm -hmm. of capabilities. I mean, do you have similar sort of uh, actions within the team that, you know, you do public talks or you engage local communities or companies or you do informational sort of uh, uh, actions in order to position not only the company as a, as a, as a knowledge leader, but also, as you said, to, to start engaging people and, and the corporate and everybody in a more uh, structured discussion? Absolutely. And it's great that you're doing that in part of yours and it's, uh, it needs to be done. I mean, I would give you the example. Imagine we as Rossify were the first company to discover solar panels and we were out there in the market trying to sell solar panels. And we were going to companies and saying, hey, just put them on the roof and everything will be fine. Like, what is this? You know, I never thought about this. And it's, that's a bit what we're doing of like, hey, there's this topic. Uh, I know you're thinking about it, but it's I, we, we know it's also challenging to implement that and let's discuss that. And um, yeah, for that, there's a huge educational part as part of our sales process. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's all about just helping people understand what is possible when you connect the dots, digitize, and then optimize and um, why that's a great, a great thing. Yeah, so we'll also, we're also looking at starting our own podcast soon. And, you know, we're doing a ton of work in, 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 in PR and around areas like this. So 
Absolutely, right? If you're not out there, if you're not spreading the message, then, uh, well, then <laughs> it's not going to work. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I want to take you into uh, something different, perhaps, uh, and then take your opinion as a as a as a young a young entrepreneur or uh, people that I guess most of your most of your also uh, colleagues are uh, uh, you know uh, on the young generation millennials that that work uh, with you. Uh, at least that's my sort of composition, my team. <laughs> that's why I can say that without being uh, you know accused for ageism. Um, but uh, that's, that's I didn't a, know that was a word. <laughs> ageism. <laughs> <Yes>. Okay. <laughs> I think I, I think there is a word ageism. Yes, I might be right, but I think there is something like that. Uh, but anyway, um, I wanted to perhaps focus a bit on um, uh, on Lutzerath, if I'm not if I'm pronouncing mm-hmm. it correctly. Uh, the demonstrations that happened uh, there with uh, WE and the uh, you know the classes over uh, you know expanding the minds and everything else. And I have to say that over the last sort of year, I've been uh, in, in many different conferences around Europe, uh, speaking uh, in panels and engaging with people afterwards and networking. And I could see straight away a divide, a divide of how do we perceive a uh, crisis. Mm-hmm. And you have an older generation, perhaps, that was brought up under different rules and may perhaps abundance of resources and materials or not caring that much about the climate as an issue, that they perceive the energy crisis as a resourcing crisis. So we, mm-hmm. we miss resources. And then you have the, the younger generation, which perceive the crisis as a climate emergency crisis. So it's not the energy, but it's the climate who is the sort of hot topic that we should be addressing. And I think we've seen that uh, sort of class very, uh, very vividly in, uh, in, in, the, in the events in, in Germany, in Lutzerath. And I just wanted to take your, um, your opinion on the matter. We had a few of our employees also went down there and were joining in there and we were seeing the photos and the videos from what was going on there. And I can relate. I think young people are frustrated. And I remember that. I've been there. You've probably been there as well, right? When you're whatever age, uh, you want action now and you don't understand why that is not possible. And it's, I mean, especially, you know, for the... Uh, younger uh, people now, then I think social media has played this enabling role just to make it relatively easy for like, hey, let's do something about this and 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 and, and can spread that message. So I think that that that's all all great. So I would certainly agree. I think we have a lot of frustration with young people and lack of action from the old older uh, people. Um, but you know what? I think that's a healthy thing. I think that's a good thing. We live in a free economy. We live in uh, supply and demand. And I think, you know, if we're demanding things, you know, supply will react. And I think that's the pressure that businesses need. Uh, these protests, they create pressure and get the ball rolling. And uh, then we see we see movement. So I think we need both. I think we need the old people that need to be told, hey, this is not okay. We need to do something about this. And, and then, you know, uh, the older people who 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 then need to react because as this generation grows up, I think we're going to see great, great historical change um, um, coming, right? But the problem is still there. So 80% uh, of all energy consumption worldwide still comes from fossil fuels. And that's concerning. And um, I can understand that frustration. And also, um, perhaps adding to that, uh, Gary, uh, there was a... Uh, was, was watching a very interesting documentary, and we we tend to discuss about um, about uh, the energy generation, and perhaps there is a solution of the energy generation with the renewables. We could go 100% green, but then if we look around us in a room, most of the materials that that we engage on a daily on a daily basis are somehow derived from fossil fuels, mm. right? From uh, from uh, from from oil, uh, plastic. Um, so what you do puts into the center of discussion of how do we deal with all the other stuff 
that, that we still use and there is no other perhaps solution or visible solution in the in the in the near future that we're going to somehow mm. you know change plastic with something else uh, and I think it's extremely important what you do and I think it's it's it goes hand to hand with the the green transition on the electricity and the energy generation element and and coming to that uh, i would like to perhaps uh, uh, close that that sort of discussion of ours by you sharing with us what would be your sort of next goals and aims what what is the next step on your entrepreneurial uh, journey circularity is the next big thing the question is only when when does it become bigger than energy and I think only once the energy transition is done, to be blunt. So I think what we need to do and what I need to do as an entrepreneur is to make sure that we're building the momentum, we're creating the foundation, we're making this possible so that once the attention swings to this topic, and it will, in the 2030s, mark my words, we will not be talking about energy anymore, we will be talking about circularity because everyone by then will have realized uh, that there is a very uh, close link. And I think uh, right now we 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 as Resourceify are in a niche. You wouldn't have heard about us unless you you know you're in this uh, niche. But that will change. And I think uh, what we need to do is to make sure that also the opportunity that we have uh, as a company from a commercial side that we're going to be realizing that once that once that big swing uh, occurs. Yeah. So. Uh, watch this space. I would say that's 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 how I see my role. That's I think how we as we also find what we need to be doing is can help you now, uh, and if you do that now, we can help you even more later, and um, then you'll be prepared for for what comes next. And therefore, we need to be prepared as resourceify for what comes next. And on that, thank you very much, uh, Gary, for for your precious time uh, and for sharing with uh, with our listeners your thoughts. Uh, I look forward to uh, to meet you also, uh, perhaps in my uh, one of my next uh, trips in Germany. Uh, yes. And 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 thank you for uh, for sharing your uh, your thoughts with us. Absolutely, Patias. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you.